We're going to talk about some really important stuff here on YouTube, but just a reminder, uh, if you want to see the whole chat, you got to go to my other platforms. But Joseph, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name is Joseph McBride of the McBride Law Firm PLLC on Park Avenue in Manhattan, New York, New York. I represent Richard Barnett. He is uh, the January Sixer who is now world famous for having his feet up on a desk in Speaker Nancy Pelosi's office. Uh, Richard was incarcerated for 109 days uh, for uh, illegal reasons and treated horrifically during that time. Glad to say that he's out, glad to be here to be able to talk about uh, the issues uh, with you, Allison and Christina today. And Christina, go ahead. Yeah. And so um, I was a paralegal for 10 years. I did civil litigation. Um, you know, I'm very interested in the legal system. Um, and so I kind of, after being a paralegal for 10 years, started uh, doing independent journalism. So uh, my my writings can be found on radixverum.substack.com. Okay. I'm going to show everybody the image that uh, Joseph was just talking about, because I think a lot of people may be familiar here. Um, not not this person here on the right with the uh, <laughs> advertisement, but this guy sitting here on the desk. Um, so yeah, so and, and it's interesting, a quick random question, because as I was reading about this, was this actually Nancy Pelosi's desk or was a desk in her office? Uh, it was a desk uh, in an office, I believe, next to her office. I'm going to go down and see the Capitol and be – I'm going to actually check it out and know 100% for certain on August 14th. I'll be down there to to take the attorney's tour, tour of the scene of the crime. But without a doubt, I can tell you that is not Nancy Pelosi's desk. Okay. It may not matter to some people, but I just wanted to clarify that one. Um, all right. Well, I, I guess let, let's start with um, – I know this is a topic that has been highly charged and politicized depending on what media you're watching, uh, what legislature, uh, you know, section of the legislature or what particular uh, political party of, of, a, of a, you know, congressional member you're listening to. Um, and so from your perspective, obviously, Joseph, you're representing someone. So uh, you, you have your own. Um, what, what is the big picture for like if you're somebody who is on considers yourself on the left or you consider yourself on the right or you're in the center or you're just apolitical altogether? I, I know you feel like this should be something that uh, everybody cares about, and I'm just curious why why you believe that. Um, and especially, I guess, for those people who are like, I'm gonna clip out of this video right away because that guy, you know, he deserves to be uh, in prison. He deserves to be where he is. And I don't even want to hear any excuses. I, I just curious where you come from on that one. Sure. So any, anyone who thinks that Richard Barnett, a 61 year old man with no criminal record who was pushed into the Capitol um, and took a, took a walk and ended up in speaker Pelosi's desk to be subsequently invited to take a picture by the media in Speaker Pelosi's office is worthy of an extended period of jail time. I mean, I'd like to have that conversation with you uh, because he is entitled to due process. He does not have a criminal record. He didn't do anything violent that day. That is an understandable emotional reaction to this situation. We understand that January 6th you know, invokes passion in people, fear in others, anxiety. Some people love the idea of what happened on January 6th and other people think, you know, that, 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 it's a, that it was a disaster. It really depends on where you fall on the spectrum. However, due process, the constitution, the first amendment, all these things are at play here. All these things are being uh, applied differently to different groups of people, depending on where you fall on the political spectrum. For instance, if you look at the riots that took place all over the United States or the protests, if you want to call them that, the mostly peaceful protests that ended up in the burning of buildings, torching of police vehicles, bombing of police stations, the killing of police officers across the United States, the militarization of black bloc and the distribution of militarized gear and riot shields and rocks 
and, and explosives all to fight the police. And then when you look at the fact that other state capitals were invaded, an entire swaths of cities like in the uh, autonomous zone known as CHOP or CHAZ were occupied for months at a time, all these people got a pass. Why did they get a pass? Because when you talk about intent, the intent the courts have said and other pundits have said and their lawyers have said was grounded in the First Amendment. And because it was grounded in the First Amendment, the original intent of the action was therefore not criminal. If you apply equal protection under the law, if you apply equal application of the law to January Sixers, you should logically be able to make that jump very easily. Yes, there are people who showed up there for nefarious purposes, but the vast majority of the people, starting with my client, showed up to protest peacefully, to petition the U.S. government for a redress of grievances and got caught up in the greater events of that day. That is not tantamount to an attack on democracy. That is certainly not tantamount to insurrection. He is without a doubt entitled to due process. And your emotion, emotional reaction aside, you should be able to set your emotions aside and let the constitutional process play out. That in and of itself should be enough for you not to click off and go somewhere else. Before we we started recording, you called it uh, this, the Abu Ghraib of, of Washington, D.C. Can you explain that a little bit? And then I know, Christina, that's kind of part of the reason why you've been paying attention to these cases, too. Sure. So, yeah, we're, Abu Ghraib is a good is another good comparison. We're formally calling it a D.C. Guantanamo Bay, but you oh, get sorry, the picture. That's right. No, that's OK. You know, that's a that's another great uh, example. So the reason why we are calling it that is a few reasons. First, um, when uh, non-citizens, uh, foreign men uh, primarily who were being accused of, of terrorism against the United States were taken from their countries and housed in Guantanamo Bay. We entered a gray and, and muddy area constitutionally in terms of what types of protections they're entitled to. During that time, the liberal left primarily, the ACLU, the United Nations and, and other groups stood up and said, hey, while we understand that these terrorists are not American citizens, they are being held by the United States of America. And because the United States of America is not North Korea or the Soviet Union or China, we demand due process. We demand lawyers. We demand rights for these people because they are human beings. And if they're going to go down in the trial by the United States, in the United States, it's got to be by our rules because we are different. And they were right about that. Now, when you see the same thing happening, the word terrorism being applied to, to United States citizens, you're seeing the same treatment that happened in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, swaths of American citizens are being held pre-trial, absent their day in court for undisclosed amounts of times and under horrible conditions, solitary confinement, 23 and 24 hours a day. Some of them are being beating, beaten. Most of them are being sleep deprived. They're being cut off from all meaningful human contact. This is solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is, de is defined as torture by the ACLU, by the United Nations, by the Mandela rule of the United Nations. We know this. So what you have now is an outcry of lawyers and constitutionalists and good journalists and people who care primarily from the center and right of center. It's curious, however, that those who were crying out about these injustices for the last 25 years are not stepping up to the plate because of politics. It's wrong and it's a scary thing. Christina, that I think that sort of uh, works into your perspective on this as well. And 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 to kind of go back to that original question of someone who's like, well, hey, they shouldn't have been there then. You know, if you don't, if you didn't want to be in solitary confinement, then you shouldn't be there. Why should why should the person who didn't go, who's looking at their like, you know what, play stupid games, get stupid prizes? Why should the average American care about that? What Joseph just described. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of people probably feel that way, right? Um, it depends on what coverage you've seen of this. And I would say for people who are who think that that might be true, I would encourage you to listen to the rest of this because you might hear details that you've never heard before uh, on other media outlets. Um, and it matters because 
you sh if you care about the rule of law in America and you care about civil rights, this is not going to stop here uh, with these particular people. What they're doing here is creating a new legal precedent. Uh, what this is is the um, like the the opening shots of their new domestic war on terrorism. And if you've been paying attention to what the Department of Homeland Security has said in their most recent bulletins of what constitutes a domestic terrorist, they're talking about people on the left. They've said if you're against capitalism, you're now a domestic terrorist. If you're concerned about the environment, you're now a domestic terrorist. So this the way that this is being sold to the public is it's about going after Trump supporters uh, and not simply to sell it to people so that they don't question it. But it, what really is happening here is the expansion of the national security apparatus in the administrative state. Uh, and there, if you think that they're going to stop with the January 6th defendants, they won't. Every time the government gives itself new powers or gets away with violating civil rights, they do not stop. Before we continue, here are a couple ways you can support my work by having a great cup of coffee in the morning and a great glass of wine at the end of the day. Big thanks to my newest sponsor, Twin Engine Coffee. You can go to twinenginecoffee.com slash Allison. They grow, select, roast, and package in Nicaragua, supporting tens of families by keeping many, many, many of the jobs local to the area. They're also USDA certified organic, fair trade, specialty grade, high altitude, and shade grown, also a family owned small business. I have had Many of their coffees at this point, I got to say my favorite is the Cuban roast because it's dark roast, but they have many of options. You can also check out their tumbler, which I also have. Keeps your coffee hot or cold, depending on how you like to drink it. So definitely check out twinenginecoffee.com slash Allison. Also, if you'd like to end your day with a nice glass of wine, don't forget allisonwinepromo.com, allison with one L winepromo.com. You get 50% off of some of my favorite wines and 50% off shipping. These are Argentinian Malbec, some very high altitude, one from the third highest vineyard in the world. Again, begin your day with a great cup of coffee, end it with a great glass of wine, and throughout the day, support free speech and my channel. This is Michael Tracy, and um, I don't know if you two are familiar with him, but he's been doing some of the reporting on this. And uh, I just picked this quick clip where he's talking about how in, in this one particular case, I think the one that re recently pled guilty, right, and was and sentenced. Do you guys remember the name? I'm having a hard time remembering. Paul Hodgkins. Uh, Hodgkins, yes, yes. Exactly, Hodgkins. Um, that they say in the the paperwork and the sentencing that uh, well, he's he was never labeled a terrorist, and so there was no there was no duty on the government's part to prove that in court. But they contextualize it in the in the, like there was terrorist activity happening around him. And so, so it's like, it's like putting you in this context of what's happening around you, not actually charging you with it, but thereby being able to sort of push you through with, with uh stricter sentencing label you that essentially indirectly how are you know so so what are the implications of that for for you not just with your sentencing but the rest of your life um you know all that stuff and and so i'll just play a quick part of what he had to say about this because i think this is interesting they're framing oh can you guys hear this okay mm -hmm. yes Hodgkin's criminal act obstruction in a context of domestic terrorism because there was all this domestic terrorism supposedly going on around him and his crime took place in that context. Well, it's one thing to just assert in this kind of colloquial or political sense that a domestic terrorism event was underway. It's another thing to actually charge that formally and have to prove it in court, which the government has not yet done. None of the 500 plus January 6th defendants at this point have been charged with domestic terrorism. And yet they are subject to these innuendos and these kind of guilt by association insinuations that they were complicit in domestic terrorism. So this is really a nightmare for the liberties. It effectively means that the government claims the ability to punish you 
in permanently as a kind of domestic terrorist without ever having to prove it formally. And just curious what you two think about that. Uh, sure. Uh, Christina, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a very good e explanation for why everybody should care about this, regardless of where you stand politically. Um, the reason that they're doing this is because they can't actually charge these people as terrorists. They can't prove that in a court of law, which requires, you know, evidence. Um, so what they're doing is they're kind of putting that that guilt by association. Well, there was terrorist activity and you were near it. You were in proximity to other people doing things that you couldn't stop them from doing. And there were certain people who got pushed into the Capitol because of the way that they had everything laid out. It created this bottleneck. You had people coming from this end and people coming from this end and the barricade set up like this some people just got pushed in. So now they're being associated with people who committed vandalism, people that attacked police officers. But even those people have not been charged with domestic terrorism. So far, out of the 500 and I think it's 38 now people who've been arrested, no one's been charged with domestic terrorism. So it's, it's a way to kind of claim that without having to prove it. And it's interesting in the context of the January 6th commission, where they're having people come up in a very controlled congressional setting to testify about what happened. And once again, there is no forensic standard in that type of event. People can make statements and say that, oh, people were shouting this at me, people said this to me, and they don't actually have to prove that. Like, if this happened, then show us the body cam footage. Let us see for ourselves what happened. It's sort of like a kangaroo court show trial type thing where they want to try these cases in the court of public opinion, and they want to make statements like these that are vague and nebulous that they don't actually have to prove. Uh, I agree uh, 100%. What, what I'll add is, is this. It, it is, it's a form of, uh, of I want to say burden shifting, but it's even more than burden shifting because they, they're creating a, a, a burden to where none exists. And, and what I mean is that they are calling people insurrectionists despite the fact that no one has been charged with insurrection. So not only do you have to defend against your trespass charge and you know, whatever, whatever other charges, you know, disorderly conduct and all the other things that somebody may or may have not been charged with, you now have to defend against insurrection to a jury when you haven't been charged with it. And now you're also being called a terrorist. Why is the word terrorist being used? The word terrorist is being used because terrorists, as we know from Guantanamo Bay, don't get the full scope of due process, military tribunals can be created for them, so on and so forth. This is also uh, commiserate with an, in, an indicia of the uh, aggressive increase of the surveillance state. People don't like to hear the term Nazi or Gestapo. They don't like to hear the term Soviets or or, or Lenin. But you know, when people hear the, the, those terms, they're understandably triggered because they go to the worst, you know, you, you, hear, you hear Nazi, you think concentration camp. You hear Soviets, you think one thing, but you have to take the steps back and you have to remember about the years during which these regimes came to power and what do they have in common? Burning of books, which is a, which, which which is censorship here. You have big tech doing that. Scapegoating of people. Well, we all know that Trump supporters are being are being scapegoated, and then after people are being scapegoated, you have the hunting down of one group of people by the group of people in power. Right now, we know who is in power, and we know who is being hunted. Those things are happening here, and then you just have an absolute disregard for law. For instance, when you look at the sentencing of Mr. Hodgkins, sentencing is an intimate 
and very personal experience. One of the most personal experiences that somebody can ever go through in life. It is inherently shameful. You have, um, or you're already sort of taking a loss. You're admitting guilt and culpability, and the government knows that. In order for, especially in a federal court, especially in a hostile federal court, you have to throw yourself upon the mercy of the court. So going in, a good lawyer is going to counsel the client and say, hey, listen, you're going to go in there. You're going to apologize. You're going to do your best to make amends and say, hey, this is an aberration. This is really not you know, indicative of who you are as a man and throw yourself upon the mercy of the court. That's good advice. But the U.S. Attorney's Office no, knew that that was going to happen. So the U.S. Attorney's Office purposefully used that event and improperly and nefariously used that event to attack a defenseless defendant in court by calling him a terrorist, by saying, while you haven't been charged with terrorism, you look like a terrorism, you walk like a terrorism, you had a Trump flag in your hand, therefore you are a terrorist. And guess what? If you object if you say, hey, government, hey, prosecutor, what the hell are you talking about? I haven't been charged with terrorism. I'm not pleading guilty to terrorism because I'm not a terrorist. They're going to take your eight months and turn it into eight years because you've already pled guilty. So therefore, you are not in a position to object and you're going to be stigmatized. Not only that, the rest of the January Sixers are now being co-branded as terrorists as well. And when you add in the fact that that in these sentencing uh, situations, people are talking about accepting the election results, not objecting. I mean, what is this? Bowing to the king? Kiss my ring? Otherwise, you get the guillotine? This is wrong. The Constitution of the United States and its very important amendments was created in times like these, four times like these, because the people who wrote those inspired documents were very familiar with the consequences of and, and, the, and just the sheer brutality associated with uh, despotism and absolute power. And we are seeing a return to that type of thing. And unless people continue to stand up and continue to call this out at every turn and every corner, all will be lost. I am of the opinion that truth, justice, you know, light will cast out the darkness in the end, but we are in the thick of it now. They are overstepping. We are seeing this now with some of the other things that are happening with the double double think and the double stepping on some of the, I don't want to get you censored either, but some of the other things that are happening right now with the change, oh, if you do this for six months, you'll be okay. And now we're going to put you back in your house. People on the left are finally starting to wake up and say, hey, look, I believed what they were saying but it, apparently it's not true. And if they've lied about this, then maybe they're lying about that as well. But it's wrong. And, uh, you know, we, we have to continue to fight. We can absolutely get into that. Uh, great plug again, though, for why people should go and check out my other <laughs> platforms and want to talk about the COVID policy stuff. Um, I wanted to play a quick clip from this uh, select committee hearing where we heard from some of the officers. Um, you know, there was a lot of really it's it's difficult to listen to some of this stuff. Um, and I just like to get both of you to just respond to, to some of that. I know, you know, I can show some stuff after it. There's been questions about, OK, so the average person I think would have a reaction to, to this stuff. Like that this was terrible. What happened to these officers? Um, I think I've seen a lot of people say, okay, so then why did this happen? You know, why does a, a country that um, have so many rules, especially past uh, 9-11, you know, ha with security what, what and, and intelligence and surveillance and stuff like that, what, why, why did this happen at all? You know, you'll see like the New York times recently had a headline that kind of, insinuated that maybe, you know, Trump wanted this to happen because he stacked the FBI with loyalists. And so so what what was up with that? Uh, you see, like uh, Glenn Greenwald here real fast exploiting police emotion. Oh, you can't see it. Well, I'll show you in a second. Um, what exploiting police emotions, um, but not asking questions about the FBI. And maybe this is serving some other purpose. Uh, so I'll play it real fast and just get your thoughts on it. And let me know if you can't hear it. I heard someone scream. I got one. As I was swarmed by a violent mob, they ripped off my badge. They grabbed and stripped me of my radio. 
They seized ammunition that was secured to my body. They began to beat me with their fists and with what felt like hard metal objects. At one point, I came face to face with an attacker who repeatedly lunged for me and attempted to remove my firearm. I heard chanting from some in the crowd, get his gun and kill him with his own gun. I was aware enough to recognize I was at risk of being stripped of and killed with my own firearm. I was electrocuted again and again and again with a taser. I'm sure I was screaming, but I don't think I could even hear my own voice. My body camera captured the violence of the crowd directed toward me during those very frightening moments. It's an important part of the record for this committee's investigation, for the country's understanding of how I was assaulted and nearly killed as the mob attacked the Capitol that day. And I hope that everyone will be able to watch it. The portions of the video I've seen remain extremely painful for me to watch at times, but it is essential that everyone understands what really happened that tragic day. During those moments, I remember thinking there was a very good chance I would be torn apart or shot to death with my own weapon. I thought of my four daughters who might lose their dad. I remain grateful that no member of Congress had to go through the violent assault that I experienced that day. During the assault, I thought about using my firearm on my attackers, but I knew that if I did, I would be quickly overwhelmed. And that in their minds would provide them with the justification for killing me. So I instead decided to appeal to the, any humanity they might have. I said as loud as I could manage, I've got kids. Would either one of you like to respond to the testimony of that day or, or how, uh, you know, how you think through this? Cause I, I would assume that both of you or neither of you, um, uh, sit there and say like, well, you know, too bad. I'm I'm assuming that you, you probably also have similar reactions. I don't know, but you tell me. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, I am a mother. <laughs> I have a child. I can feel for a parent, um, and I can't imagine what it would be like to be in that situation, uh, and and being in a a mob that's not thinking correctly. Um, and I will say this: um, this is what happens every time you have a mob of people it you get this like group think that starts happening right it all it takes is a couple provocateurs or a couple people to start riling the crowd up and then people stop thinking like they normally would uh, i don't doubt that he experienced what he claims he experienced and i'd love to see the body cam footage just to see what happened that day as an example of uh, what happens when you have these out of control mobs, um, you know, it's very probably very similar to what we saw with Antifa uh, in Washington, D.C. and uh, BLM people rioting. They burned down a Secret Service guard tower. So I'm sure it was very similar to what those people experienced. And I'm not denying what happened to him. However, I think you need to look at the context of how did it happen? Fanon wasn't even supposed to be there that day. He chose to kind of run into the line of fire and put himself in that situation because he heard things on the radio system and he wanted to go down there uh, and help protect the Capitol in his mind. Um, but the question is, at the leadership level, why was this allowed to occur? Why were there? Why was there no security in the first place? Why were the calls for the National Guard initially denied? And what role did the FBI play in perhaps amping up some of the militia groups that were there that day um, to where it got to be like that? You know, uh, I agree in part. I disagree in part. Uh, I, I, I agree that... On the human level, sure, we can all understand it. Uh, I think he's acting. I truly do. Um, I think that the I I know that that commission is a it's a dog and pony show. 
the National Police Association called it exactly that, said it was a, a dog and pony show, condemned those the, the testimony of, of those officers. Listen, you were trained, and this is what you signed up for. I have a hard time reconciling the congressmen, Adam Schiff, Kinzinger, and those other guys that were up there crying, uh, you know, for their re recitation of the events that happened that day, um, when these are the same people that supported Antifa and Black Lives Matter as they chanted, die, pig, die, fry, pigs in a blanket, where cops were being shot and attacked in the streets, all of a sudden, defund the police. Vice President Kamala uh, Harris, you know, participating in the bailing out of people who were not just run-of-the-mill protesters, but highly violent agitators. All of a sudden, these people care when it suits their needs. Come on, man. I am not buying it. Most people are not buying it. One of my best friends in the world is, 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 a, is a New York City uh, detective. He, he happened to be off that day. He was here. We were watching things together, and he doesn't buy it. Um, I, I've spoken to lots of people. They don't buy it. This is a dog and pony show. You know, the other officer who was up there um, comparing this to Iraq, to Iraq? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I, I, and what are you talking about? Hand to hand urban combat, IEDs blowing the legs off of soldiers, massive casualties, massive death. When you're up there comparing this, I've been in New York City most of my life. I'm born and bred Brooklyn guy. And I remember 9 11 to say that this was to equivocate this to 9 11. And those officers' experience with, with, with the loss of life of NYPD firemen and NYPD police officers and, and first responders who died that day and just the mass destruction of what real terrorism looks like. To compare to that day is, is I, I, I'm at a loss for words. It's disgusting. It's inaccurate. It's wrong. And then to pretend to pretend that the Capitol has not been attacked before, that, I mean, senators have been shot in the Capitol. Um, Elizabeth Ann Duke and, and Susan Rosenberg, who was one of the, Susan Rosenberg, one of the top fundraisers for Black Lives Matter, blew a 17 foot hole in a Senate, in a Senate chamber in 1983. Uh, code paint uh, protesters who were there protesting uh, Justice Kavanaugh's uh, confirmation hearings 200 of them invaded the Capitol. I mean, to act like this is the only time or the most egregious time that this has ever happened, it's wrong. And also the things that Christina was talking about, where was the oversight? They, we know that they had advanced notice. The Capitol Police had advanced notice for almost a month beforehand. Why wasn't it fortified? When President Trump offered to send the National Guard, why was he rejected? Nancy Pelosi is, is is effectively the, the the supreme commander of the Capitol Police. Is she going to testify? Is she going to be cross examined about her decisions that day? Look, I am as pro police as it gets. I love the police. I I, I love military personnel. I respect them. I, I I believe that they are owed the highest honor in this life. Those four guys up there not buying what you're selling, not even for a second. So do you think, because he goes on to talk about being tased multiple times, like electrocuted is what he he said specifically. Um, you don't think, you think he's totally making up that he was tased that, uh, you know, I, or or you think he's, he's exaggerating it? Because I have a hard time believing that he's just completely flat out lying about what happened that day. I don't think that he's flat out lying. But what I do think is that, you know, you, this is the job you signed up for. You, you know, you're a soldier. You are a, a, a police officer. I, I get it. But to, to get up there and to say, wow, my job got really hard one day. And there was a day 
for the Capitol Police where I, you know, we actually had to to engage like real police officers do in urban areas on, on, on a daily basis. Look, I get it. I get what happened. But do I think it's appropriate to have these hearings now? Do I think it's appropriate considering the fact that the FBI is still arresting January Sixers in front of grandparents, in front of their grandchildren, mothers in front of their sons. The people are still being being dragged into the gulag in D.C. That these investigations are still happening, and that not one trial has happened yet. There are been over five hundred arrests. There could foreseeably be hundreds of trials that are coming, and you are creating a subjective record that's going to be stamped as congressional evidence then to use at trial while simultaneously continuing to poison the entire jury pool this is wrong it shouldn't be happening now i do not like it the whole thing stinks to high heaven and 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 most of the people who are in my community of defense attorneys feel the same way not you know none of us who are reasonably minded think that this is a good idea I think that's a, a good point. Uh, I just want to say also that um, there was a story that initially came out about what happened to Officer Brian Sicknick, and we were told he was bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher, and that turned out to be a lie. That turned out not to be true at all. So we do have to kind of be a little bit skeptical with these claims because we never found out what happened um, until... I think maybe a month and a half, maybe three months later, uh, when the medical examiner said, no, he actually died of uh, cardiac arrest hours after the fact he had texted with his family uh, after the riot and everything. So I think we have to treat it with skepticism. But he, I think that Joseph makes a very good point about the sort of like prejudicing of these cases before they even go to trial. How are they supposed to have a fair uh, trial when you're having this kind of presentation where w there isn't a forensic uh, threshold here for the evidence. I mean, people can just make these statements and it might be exaggerated. Although I do know for a fact there were people who had brought tasers that day. Um, you know, I don't doubt that he experienced some of this, but I do question sort of the timing. And I do think we also need to remain a little bit skeptical. This is a short clip for YouTube. If you want to see the entirety of this conversation, head to my other platforms. The links are in the description. 